Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from Rio de Janeiro. My name is Amanda Oliveira, a youth advocate from Ten Minute Talks. We are one of the Brazilian partners of IFFD, and I'm honored to conduct this event today. This year, the IFFD briefing and award ceremony will be held virtually for the first time. We will address parenting the digital age, policymakers' perspective, together with our sponsors of the Permanent Nations of Malaysia and the State of Qatar and the Division for Inclusive Social Development of UNDSA. With no further delay, I want to introduce Mr. Olivier Yao, World President of the International Federation of Family Development and Family Enrichment Coordinator of Ivory Coast. Please, Olivier, you have the floor for the welcoming re remark. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to start this big event by appreciating our sponsors today. We have the privilege to have the support of the permanent mission of Malaysia as a strong advocate in making cities more family friendly with a prominent institute on family policies in the region. At the same time, we are honored to organize this event with the permanent mission of the state of Qatar, who has been the facilitator of the General Assembly's resolution on family for almost two decades. And this year also is a member of the Bureau for this commission. Last but not least, we acknowledge the Division for Inclusive Social Development for the engagement in this event and promoting family policies throughout the whole UN system. As you know, the International Federation for Family Development, IFFD, has been organizing this briefing at the UN headquarters in New York during the session of the Commission for Social Development since 2013. This year's topic of the Commission on Social Development is very relevant for our parenting courses and as well for our advocacy work. More since a similar issue will be also featured in the International Day of Family, observance at the UN next May. The impact of new technologies will be most probably featured as one of the suggested mega trends by the United Nations during the preparation and celebration of the 30th anniversary of the International Year of Family in 2024. At IFFD, we are organizing various events for this purpose. Experts of our federation, the UN system, and the academia have been focusing on how policymakers can deal with the right condition for family to access internet. How telework can contribute to work family balance. The way to improve education from the remote learning experience of COVID-19 which specific policies can help to bridge the intergenerational di digital divide? What instrument should be developed to ban child abuse material online? And what is the best tools parents can use to prevent online abuse for their children? As in previous years, we are granting today our IFRD awards. My big congratulation to the governments of states of Carinthia for their policies and to Tom Harrison for his book that can help so much the parents on how to educate on new technologies. I want also to take this opportunity to confirm and reaffirm once more our commitment to help the whole United Nations system with the collaboration of our more than 250 family enrichment centers and around 9,000 volunteers located across 70 countries. In IFFD, we are implementing a program to introduce technological changes in our process to keep communication among the members and to give to the new generation relevant roles in the organization. 
as you can see, we have invited today one of our many young colleagues and partners who also introduced a surprise input at the end of this meeting. Amanda, thank you very much for your contribution and to all of you, thank you for your presence. Thank you very much, Olivier, for your kind words and for counting with the youth perspective in so many countries. And yes, I recommend you to wait till the very end of the youth event to see what we have done globally. Up until then, I now give the floor to Ms. Sharifa Alness, Vice Chairperson of the Bureau of the Commission for Social Development for opening remarks. Ms. Alness, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure to welcome you at this annual briefing, which brings us together to show support and advocate for family issues within the agenda of the CSOPD sessions. I would like to express my gratitude to the International Federation for Family Development for organizing this event. My gratitude is also extended to our co-organizers, the Permanent Mission of Malaysia to the UN and uh, to, to the UN DESA. Ex Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Parenting is in a rapidly digitized world, which is currently accelerated by COVID-19 pandemic, is definitely becoming an issue of concern to parents uh, all around the world. The physical and mental health of children, uh, their safety and protection from uh, cyberbullying, among other concerns, uh, are inc increasingly emerging as priority issues for social policymakers. Uh, today, today we look forward to have a fruitful discussion with uh, our distinguished panelists on how this rapid digitized of human experiences is affecting children and parenting. Our discussions are crucial uh, for enriching uh, the ongoing debates on uh, most appropriate policies to support parents in building a digital world that works better for children, family and the community. In context of this, this, the, these discussions, I would like to uh, draw your attention to the study on COVID-19 and the family that Hamad bin Khalifa University is a partner uh, in it to explore the effects on the coronavirus pandemic on family life across cultures. The results of this study are the results of the, uh, this study are of crucial importance uh, to fund policies, programs, and to support the family during these tiring times. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to take this opportunity to inform you of the international conference titled Marriage Formation uh, of uh, Marriage and Formation, which is organized by the Doha International Family Institute, DP, on February 23rd uh, till 25th, uh, 2021, and we look forward for your participation. In conclusion, I would like to congratulate the winners of the IFFT Family Award. Uh, their efforts and achievements are highly appreciated, and we wish them more success in promoting family values. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ms. Almas. We now turn to the interactive discussion about evidence-based policy recommendations on parenting and new technologies. We have invited three experts to discuss the policymakers' perspective. The discussion will be moderated by Renata Katsmarska, focal point on the family of the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Ms. Katsmarska, you have the floor. Uh, so as you all know, parents around the globe are concerned not so much about their children, uh, if their children are spending too much time online, but more about how their online interactions are impacting on their health, on their happiness, and on their well-being. That is why the interactive discussion will focus on how policymakers can help parents and families to develop character and cyber wisdom in their children. It will spare parents proactivity in seeking to cultivate values, qualities, and skills in their children. So in our discussion, we, we have several points. So um, number one, what is access what is access and opportunities to dig digital technologies among different families? What are the digital opportunities access for all? Number two, how the digital gap impacts the sustainability and efficiency of parenting? And how policymakers, industry leaders, and global media partners support parents build a digital world that works better for every child, 
family and community. So also please uh, note that questions can be written in the chat box starting right now. So our first um, speaker will be Tracy uh, C. Burns. She's a senior analyst of the Educational Research and Innovation at OECD. Tracy ha um, has a portfolio of projects including innovating teaching for effective learning, 21st century children and trends shaping education. Until recently, she was also responsible for their work on governing complex education systems. She has worked on social determinants on health and well-being and led a research in British Columbia University team investigating newborn infants' responses to language. She has been recipient of numerous awards as lecturer on infant and child development, the University of British Columbia Postdoctoral Fellowship, and the American Psychological Association Dissertation Research Awards. Tracy holds a BA from McGill University, Canada, and an MA and Doctor of Philosophy in Psychology from Northeastern University, USA. Tracy, we turn to you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for this invitation and the opportunity to present to you. Um, I have some slides which I will try and share, um, and hopefully that will work. Uh, so if you can see them, that would be great. So I'll send, I'll put in the chat links the two volumes that have come out on educating children in the 21st century. Uh, one is about emotional well-being and the other one is about happy and healthy children. And so our work has really looked at the intersection between sort of well-being and the digital age. And I was asked to present in sort of a sort of recommendation form. So I'll I'll sort of distill our five policy messages for you here in the eight minutes that I have. Um, and the first one is very basic um, about building a better evidence base. We have very little data on particularly zero to eight year olds and their use of technology, but also the impacts of that use, even less on parents and the interaction there. Um, we have very little longitudinal and experimental evidence, and that's just incredibly important to put together. At the OECD, we do have one study. This is our international early learning study, which shows these are five-year-olds from three countries, so quite a, quite a limited data set, um, but just shows, of course, what we already know, which is that five-year-olds use technology often, uh, every day, substantially, or at least weekly for most cases. Um, and interestingly, it's actually connected or positively linked to a number of outcomes. For example, mental flexibility, or whether or not um, children have actually used digital devices in these three countries. Um, obviously, this would need to be replicated in more countries, but it's an interesting discussion point around how we want to position ourselves in terms of using digital devices and how best to aid children get the sort of positives while reducing the negatives. The second major point I'd like to make is, um, now my screen is frozen. Um, I'll just keep going, is about addressing policy fragmentation. Um, and so effectively what happens uh, when we have, okay, this might work, yeah. Um, effectively when we're looking at this, we're thinking about uh, how we're gonna support parents and teachers. And we have three aspects. We're thinking about access, and I'm not gonna speak a lot about that because I think Matt from UNICEF will cover that, or at least I hope he will. There's the skill development part, and then there's also what we would like to think of as digital citizenship. So not just basic skills, but actual skills to take part in the digital world. And each of these three is important to keep in mind and essential, actually. But when we think about it from a policymaker's perspective, access is handled by education ministries and schools, but also by science and technology ministries, by regulatory bodies, by a number of different policy mechanisms. Skills, similarly, also youth ministries, kindergartens, etc., social affairs ministries. And so you've got different players on a national level and multiple, multiple players on local levels and then more players on international levels. And what we've got in this very complicated mix is not a great way to regulate or understand the governance of this system. So if we really want to think about how we want to support parents and teachers, we have to think what suits them nationally, but we also have to think about what suits them internationally, because this is an inherently global borderless world. And one of the things that we like to underline is, of course, it's very clear that disadvantaged children, so and this is even looking within the OECD, children from poorer households, 
children who have uh, tend to come uh, from poorer neighborhoods, that they have let they tend on average to have less good skills, less good digital skills. They also were the ones hardest hit during COVID because they were least able to transfer online. Their schools were least able to ha ha to help them. And their parents were also least able to give them the help they needed in terms of digital skills and helping with their homework. So it was actually sort of a perfect storm of impact on them that left them potentially even further behind than their more advantaged peers. And we see this play through in the entire system, the importance of really understanding how to intervene with those children who are most at risk. And when we say intervene, I speak often with education, we speak about schools, but we also mean in the family and with parents, because children need to be able to understand their connection to digital skills. And it's the home environment that often teaches them a lot about it. It's certainly their earliest exposure. Um, going through, if we think about the last two points, which is acknowledging the importance of tradition, culture, and priorities, and also including the voices of children, we can't forget this. We often have a discussion around these issues, around the risks, around the sort of things, the negatives, the things we might be sort of worried about, but we don't always ask kids what they actually really like about the digital world and why they're such early adopters and why they're so enthusiastic about it. And part of that is broadening our questions. We work in OECD countries. This is the UN, a much broader conversation. Part of it is asking the right questions and part of it is listening also to parents, teachers, but also the children. And one of the things we wanted to highlight is when we think about parenting in the digital age, this conversation is happening in a very broad kind of context where there's changes in parenting that are not just about the di digital world. So helicopter parenting, which is something, you know, very familiar to many, sort of the overprotective parenting, it's been around since the 1960s. It's very common now in the, since the 1980s. There's a decent amount of research on it. It doesn't appear to have particularly good outcomes for the children. Um, but there's also elements of parental behavior which are very specific to the digital world, which we also have to think about. And right now it's not really on the policy radar, at least the education policy radar. And I'll just highlight two of those. One is fubbing, which is, you know, technoference. There's a number of different words for it. But when parents snub their kids because they're on the phone or they're on a mobile device, this has been researched since 19 or 2014. It's a very new area of research. We know very little about it. But we need to know more because there's a suggestion that in fact it's the most, it's the parents who are the most disadvantaged with the least amount of digital skills who are the ones who do this more. And just to finish, the last one is about sharenting, which is sharing about their children on social media. This is, of course, we all know, uh, it's exciting. You announce even the birth of a child on social media before they're even born. But there are really specific questions about the digital footprint of children and their identity when they're in fact not giving consent to their data being shared before they're born and in their early years. So all of these are things that we will actually flag as important to think about when we think about our policies and we really try and understand what works, the evidence base, of course, connecting the dots, supporting our parents and teachers, and nuancing to hear the voices, the culture, the tradition, the priorities, and listening to the kids. I'll stop here. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Tracy. Um, now we turn to um, Amina Fazl. Oslula, Equity Policy Council at Common Sense Media. Amina is the Equity Policy Council in Common Sense Media in Washington, D.C., where she works on a range of issues, including privacy, expanding access to technology, and digital well-being. Prior to joining Common Sense Media, Amina was a Tech Policy Fellow at Mozilla, where she worked to promote broadband connectivity in under um, the third communities around the world. Amina has also worked with the Benton Foundation, U.S. Public Interest Research Group, for the Honorable Chief Judge James uh, Rosenbaum of the U.S. District Court of Minnesota and at the FCC. Amina, we turn to you. Thank you. Um, I'm so excited and honored to be here. Um, this topic is very important to me and my organization, and so I'm really glad to see it taken up. Um, so what I wanted to start with today is talking through um, 
what um, could drive policymakers to help close the digital divide and what are those sort of key policy pieces? Um, you know, so let's, let's just start by a little bit of an assessment of what's happened thus far. I think the pandemic has demonstrated to us um, the importance of connectivity and there's so much that flows over the internet um, that uh, supports families and children. Um, pandemic response, the ability to appropriately socially distance, education, um, now um, speeding vaccinations um, across countries is also uh, critically dependent on access to the internet or can be improved through access to the internet. Um, and so much more that also flows over that touches and concerns parents and caregivers, job training, remote work, etc. There's so many different facets of life now that flow through the internet. So it's critical that families have access to high quality internet. And when I say this, I think that it's important for us to think through also the tech specs of all the uses. Um, so I'm gonna step back just for a moment and, and start to, to tick through what I think is um, you know, a good way for policymakers to view this work. Um, one is to close the digital divide, we've got to have robust assessments. And these assessments need to be on a wide variety of issues. Um, the first assessment, of course, is around um, the quality of service um, that is available to your communities, that is available to families. Um, understanding where your infrastructure actually, actually exists, what the speeds are, what the quality of service is, who is providing that infrastructure access. Um, and then also doing assessments that um, touch trusted partners, um, working through schools or other community institutions that families trust is a very good way to try to get this granular information and to be able to repeat it um, so that your efforts can be iterative and improve over time. Um, so not just for sort of the broad scale sort of census level assessment, but then also this very detailed assessment that relies on these trusted institutions. Um, and when you ask those questions to a trusted institution, you can have much more robust data. So you can understand the digital inclusion needs of a family, the digital citizenship needs of a family, the languages spoken within the family, um, whether or not the students and the caregivers need that type of support the level of IT support a family needs, um, the types of devices a family needs, and the quality of service they have access to when it comes to broadband service. Um, all of these pieces are really critical to building a very strong policy program to close the digital divide. Once you have those pieces in place, um, it's important for policymakers then to support both centralized and decentralized approaches to procurement. Um, one of the biggest hurdles for closing the digital divide is cost. Cost is a huge hurdle for most families who are in the digital divide. It's not a lack of understanding how to use it necessarily. It's a lack of the cost benefit analysis of uh, paying for something that is incredibly expensive on their budget and then understanding the value of how it may support their lives going forward. Those two pieces together actually demonstrate to us that cost is a very big factor. So making sure that policies are in place to support um, cost for subscriptions and cost for devices is critical. Um, supporting large anchor institutions like schools is a good way to help drive down costs because if they take on the role of um, procurement then you're able to take advantage of bulk procurement in this sort of centralized model. Um, that may work for some communities, it may not work for others. So there's, it's important that policymakers are flexible in their approaches to cost supports um, and don't overburden the community institutions that are in place, but rather give them as much support and flexibility to be able to actually um, utilize resources to procure um, uh, broadband service and devices. Um, and then next, it's really important um, to create a continued um, environment where um, connectivity um, is available. So what I'm trying to get at is that 
deployment is often spotty in most countries. Um, in the United States, there are plenty of families who do not have access to any form of high quality internet. Um, they're unable to connect, not just because of cost, but also because they just don't have the resources passing by them. Um, so it's important that policymakers also invest in deploying infrastructure. This infrastructure can't at the fastest possible rate. It has to be deployed um, with an eye towards quality. Um, it's important that when critical and limited government resources are put into infrastructure programs, that they're building not just for today, but also for the future. It's important to make sure that they meet today's needs. Um, our report found that to do robust distance learning, um, you needed 200 down and 10 up um, MBPS. Um, that's a big number um, in a lot of communities. Um, but if we only build to that number today, surely just months down the road, we'll, we'll discover new applications and those infrastructures, uh, that deployment that has already been paid for and put in the ground will soon become obsolete. So it's important that um, uh, policymakers are deploying with an eye towards future-proof networks as well. Um, and finally, I think it's important for us to gather, I think, um, as much information on the types of use cases and where the innovations can actually lead, and then what is lost when we don't actually invest in these types of um, supports for families. So um, Common Sense has found that, that um, very conservatively, we've estimated that there's $22 billion lost um, <clears throat> in uh, economic benefit to the country every year. Um, as long as children remain in the digital divide. Um, there are other institutions that have done similar analysis. Um, there's certainly a huge loss if you don't actually invest in technology. And so under better understanding what that loss actually looks like um, helps drive, I think, better policy decisions in terms of how um, committed policymakers will be to making sure they actually close the digital divide with not just robust support in the short term but with an eye towards the long term as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Amina. Um, now we move to uh, Matt Grossard. He is a Chief of Education and Development Unit at UNICEF, Office of Research at, uh, in Ascenti. Uh, Matt joined UNICEF in 2012 as Senior Education Advisor at UNICEF Headquarters where he was leading the education systems, innovation, data, and evidence for results team. Uh, he was responsible for leading on strategy development, including the UNICEF Global Education Strategy 2019-2030, Every Child Learns. Innovations, evidence, and analytical tools for policy dialogue at country level. Before joining UNICEF, Matt served at the World Bank as senior education economist at UNESCO um, I have called the uh, Dakar as education policy analyst and at the UNESCO Institute for Statistics as education statistician. Matt is a graduate of the French National School of Statistics and Economics and also holds a Diplôme d'études approfondies in sociology from Paris Institute of Political Studies. Matt, the floor is yours. Many thanks, uh, Renata, and thanks for, for the invitation. I'm uh, delighted to be in this event to discuss this uh, important topic. So as you said, um, I have the privilege to lead the education unit uh, at the UNICEF Office of Research in Ocenti, uh, based in the lovely city of Florence in Italy that you can see in my background. Um, we have a, a growing portfolio in education with uh, 20 qualitative and quantitative researchers um, who apply mixed methods uh, across about 10 research programs in more than 40 countries that are mainly low income and middle income countries. So maybe my perspective would be more on the low and middle income countries than the, than the presentation from Tracy and OECD. But in broad terms, we focus a lot on learning and on equity in particular for the poorest and the, the most vulnerable children. And we are doing more and more primary research on digital learning, for example, on this uh, 
digital language course called Achilles, implemented for refugees and migrant children in uh, Lebanon and Greece, and more and more research on the digital platform that maybe some of you know called the Learning Passport, that is implemented in partnership with uh, Microsoft. In the, in the context of COVID, we have uh, actually recently done more secondary research on the access and opportunities to digital technologies for learning. And we also got uh, approval for producing a, a policy brief on how to unlock uh, digital learning for, for the G20 of this year as part of the task force on digital transformation. So I can share, uh, if you want, I can share a few of our key findings and uh, try to give a related policy implication that we, we found. Uh, first, maybe just putting the things into context, even before the pandemic, uh, as most of you know, I'm sure everybody knows, the world was experiencing already a learning crisis. Um, I mean, there is this striking number that is really uh, outbreaking that half of children could not read a simple text by the age of 10 uh, in low and middle income countries. So, COVID and related school closure have, have not helped. It have actually exacerbated this learning crisis with an estimate from the World Bank of uh, 10 percentage point uh, more children in what they call learning poverty, meaning the, the proportion of children not able to, to read a simple text by the age of 10. Uh, of course, linked to the 1.5 billion uh, learners that were affected by the, the school closure at the peak of the, of the crisis. Um, so COVID has definitely exacerbated the disparity in education and has actually acted as a, an, equal, an equalizer of, uh, uh, within the world instead of having education being an equalizer, which is his main goal. Um, I mean, we, we, we estimated the global number in reference to access and linked to the digital divide that were talked about by uh, Tracy and uh, Amina. Um, to, at maximum during the crisis, 26% of children were potentially rich uh, through a digital uh, online learning solution at home. Only 26% maximum based on the household assets, connectivity at home, et cetera. It's estimated based on uh, our social surveys. So it means seven, three quarters of the children were not able to, to have access to such uh, solution during the school closures. And uh, in the poorest countries and poorest family, uh, there is also still the big issue of uh, even just access to, to electricity, to power, uh, let alone internet. Uh, if you look at low-income countries, the estimate that is available is only 40% of the population with electricity. And of course, there is even uh, worse cases when you take uh, the estimate on a country basis. Like in, I, I, I just look at uh, several data. In Chad, only 12% of the population have access to electricity. In Niger, only 18%. So of course, lack of, the lack of electricity also prevented to have, uh, prevented of course digital learning, but also prevented to have access to other solutions that some government have put in place during the school closure, like TV or radio programs. Uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, more than half of school children could not be reached by any either online or TV radio uh, learning programs during the, the, the crisis. And even in rich countries, actually, uh, there are still issues when it relates to access to digital learning, like, to say, like, like it was said by uh, the previous panelists. Uh, for example, we have just released a report called Learning at a Distance on the situation in Italy, the country where I live. It was done jointly uh, with a university and uh, with uh, the research center of the European Commission. And it was based on data collected from more than 1,000 families across uh, Italy. And we found out that about 27% of family report, families reported not having suitable technology during the lockdown in Italy. And 30% of parents said they didn't have time to support their children with remote learning. One last point in terms of findings is related to gender norms. Uh, there are still a lot of gender norms when it relates to the use of internet in uh, many countries. We have done research uh, using, again, uh, household surveys uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, 
showing a big uh, gender divide uh, on uh, ICT skills, uh, mainly due to the fact that in some families, parents are not really comfortable to let their girl, to let the girls access the internet. So if I turn in terms of uh, potential policy implication, uh, at UNICEF, we are engaged in supporting countries and governments with a, with a new big initiative called uh, Reimagine Education. Uh, it means, of course, as said previously, putting extra effort for reducing the digital divide, in particular for the poorest countries and the poorest families, supporting increase in connectivity, in access to devices, in uh, subs subsidizing uh, you know, data usage costs for families, in particular the poorest, but also in the meantime, not forgetting the most vulnerable children without internet or even without electricity, uh, with low tech or no tech remote learning solutions. Um, if we want to, to stop exacerbating for the, the disparities across and within countries, uh, having digital learning platform working in no and low connectivity context is definitely a must. Uh, also, there are more and more evidence that ICT tools do not lead automatically to learning outcomes. There are some things working, some things working less. What we see more and more prominent in the research is the importance to have the tools, the digital tools, the digital platform, learning platform, embedded in a relevant pedagogical approach. Tracy touched a bit on that. Blended approach works better than just self standalone tools like blended approach understood as using still the teachers sometimes with a new role. And the third thing that is very important based on the research we've, that we found is the importance of feedback loop from users to, to keep on improving the, the digital tool or platform as it is uh, implemented. And finally, we, there are still so many evidence gaps so more research and evidence is needed on digital learning in different settings. We need, we need much more evidence on what works and on how to scale up what works and make it work for the whole education system. Uh, it includes doing more implement, what we call implementation science or implementation research for finding out the most effective implementation modality. It is just of so crucial importance for millions of children and, and their future lives. So I will stop here, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Matt, and thank you for reminding us about the digital as well as the gender divide. Um, and now, uh, we'll actually turn to um, His Excellency Ambassador, Dr. Alexander Marschik, Permanent Representative of Austria to the United Nations in New York. Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me thank the International Federation for Family Development for organizing this meeting and allowing me to speak on behalf of Austria. Uh, we just listened to a very interesting question about parenting in the digital age and uh, indeed our modern digital world brings so many opportunities but also some challenges including for children and the intergenerational dialogue about the risks and the opportunities of digital possibilities is crucial. Uh, I'm a father of three children who are all currently studying at school uh, uh, and at university with digital means primarily, and so I followed the panel with a lot of interest. And perhaps I can uh, just add one remark. Uh, I completely agree that education can benefit enormously from digital means, of course. That's clear, and that's not only uh, the hardware uh, and software that are uh, decisive in that context. Uh, my youngest daughter attended her Austrian school virtually from our house in Corinthia, close to the Milstedt estate, during a lockdown last spring. She's currently attending uh, the New York school, mainly virtually from New York City. And in both cases, we found that some of the classes worked really well and others did not. Uh, and the essential reason for that was whether the teachers and the students were prepared to really engage with the available digital tools. So even in our digital age that we have now, the human factor is very relevant. Permit me now to share some uh, parenting policies uh, of Austria. Around 1,125,000 families with children live in Austria. They are a foundation of our society. We respect and support them in all their, their diversity. 
Families render valuable services for children and care for dependent family members, furthering social cohesion among generations living together. The aim of the government is to create a legal, social, and economic framework and to implement measures that support family development and the well being of family overall. With its highly developed system of family benefits, Austria tries to remain a front runner in Europe. 10% of the federal budget directly benefits families through the Family Burden Equalization Fund. One core concern is the reconciliation of work and family life for parents. This is work in progress. We're constantly trying to improve means to provide an individualized optimal framework of financial support and infrastructure, in particular, childcare. With a solid infrastructure for children three years and older already in place, we have now put a re reinforced focus on expanding childcare for younger children. Raising awareness for work, family life balance, including through public-private partnerships, is also part of our strategy. Austria champions an active fatherhood and encourages a modern role perception between both parents, including through various parental leave models. The federal government also subsidizes high quality parental education projects to increase the variety of affordable parental education by various bodies, particularly nonprofit organizations. Another priority for Austria is supporting parents to raise their children without violence. Violence free upbringing makes a huge difference for society, but support for parents requires addressing the often very different needs of families and approaches to education by the parents. Like many others, Austria has banned all forms of corporal punishment in the context of children education and upbringing. Training of parents is seen as a structural and an important professional task. Experts from the field of parental education have been commissioned to draw up a curriculum with quality standards for parents, educators, training. Dear friends, these are just a few of uh, many federal policies and nationwide initiatives, but Austria also relies on the great initiatives and the indispensable hard work by our nine federal states. In this respect, it's a particular pleasure and honor for me to conclude by personally congratulating the federal government of Corinthia for the valuable work that they are doing and for the award of the IFFD, which they will receive today. Congratulations, Governor Peter Kaiser, to you and to your whole team in Frankfurt. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. I'm very happy that you mentioned work-family balance as well as parenting education, because these are our major topics that we, we follow as um, focal point on the family. So I'm grateful for that Austria is doing so much in those areas. Think, and also active fatherhood, very important. Um, just to remind everyone that we will have, an, uh, right after this event, we will have an event on uh, digital technologies and work family balance. So we'll definitely continue the discussion in, in more detail about this important topic. So now we move to the uh, question um, questions. Um, so the first question uh, we have received is um, about remote learning and the COVID-19 experience in developing countries. So Matt, to some extent, um, talked about the fact that ICT tools don't lead automatically to good outcomes. Um, but um, could we address the issue of how um, this experience shown um, some real advantages? Maybe, maybe Matt, you could um, ex uh, explore this topic a little more. So just to make sure I understood well your question, uh, can you repeat because the connection is not great. Right. So this is about developing countries. So do you see advantages of um, uh, using the digital technologies um, for learning in developing countries? How do you, you see the advantages for the future um, in developing countries? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for repeating it. I'm sorry about that. Just but connectivity even in rich country like Italy is not working that well. Um, of course, there is advantage when it is done properly, I would say. I don't want to sound like it is uh, always negative. Um, for example, uh, we have been doing this research and this uh, language learning course uh, funded by uh, Achelius Foundation. 
in no and low connectivity settings. And it, it already shows a lot of um, improvement in terms of learning outcome in writing, in speaking. It's mainly for refugees and migra migrants, so it's like uh, marginalized, vulnerable children. Now, the, the, what we see from, from the research is that the elements to make it work is, of course, to allow the system to have this function of working offline as well than online. They, they can go on back online when they need to upload the new content of the course, but needs to work also offline because there are huge digital, digital divide in those settings. It needs to be embedded within a, a, a relevant pedagogical approach with the type of skills that are needed, including those that Tracy mentioned. It needs to be with feedback loop of users because uh, that's the way Achilles program works, for example, like uh, teachers and uh, even children can report back on what are the things that are working and what are the things that are not working. And so the developers of the tool can adapt and improve the, the digital platform as it is implemented based on this feedback, it's of crucial importance. And uh, a last thing, uh, yes, keeping on doing research and evidence building on those, on those platforms, on those programs as they are implemented. Uh, so there is definitely advantage when those criteria are met, basically. At, at least that's what we see so far from the research. As I said, we are now engaging in the learning passport, in the research on the learning passport that is uh, based on the crisis, a lot, many more countries wanted to, to embark in this, uh, in this initiative, the Learning Passport, which is also a, a digital platform that is uh, for different uh, contexts. Uh, and we will try to also bring, again, bring the, put the research design that is really including this implementation science in order to also support the improvement of the platform as it developed. Did, did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Matt. Um, let's move to the next question. Um, the question is, how can parents ensure their children are having a quality education online? Perhaps Amina could, could answer this question? Sure. Um, so let me just start by chiming into the an answer for the last question as well. Um, you know the value uh, for for communities that have been traditionally underserved is great. So um, I would just note that by utilizing any forms of of technology to offer resilience in access to education, um, you expand the amount of hours that students have. Um, and so, for example, in the United States, um, when communities have um, had in-person schooling disrupted by natural disasters, wildfires, or any other events, um, students are able to continue through disruption to have access to some form of education. The other piece is in communities that um, lack uh, great educational resources, um, you're able to have, depending on the quality of telecommunications access, you're able to have more contact, again, with educational resources. Even a phone call with um, a tutor or an educator can be useful. Um, video obviously would be wonderful, but there are just additional hours that a student can have access to in an under-resourced community if they have access to some form of technology. As far as what parents need to do to support their students, um, I mean, certainly if you're using digital tools, it's important for parents themselves to understand how to provide some technical assistance to students. When students are um, faced with interruptions or disruptions with technology, they are quickly um, uh, distracted and um, may not engage with the educational content. So trying to provide as much support to sort of scaffold the student to make sure that they are buffered and protected from any kind of technological disruption is really important. Um, the other piece is just being present. Um, you know, to the extent that you're able, um, just good old fashioned presence is very, very useful. When a student is using technology, it can feel very sort of 
one on one that there isn't an opportunity to sit next to them. But just being in the same room will give a student, um, you know, a little bit of additional guidance and also will provide parents with some insight into the type of educational resources um, that are flowing to the student. So one very simple suggestion is be in the same room as your student. Thank you very much, Anina. Uh, Tracy, would you like to add anything to um, these answers? We don't have much time, but uh, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. I mean, they're, they're great answers, and so I can only sort of fill in on the edges. I think, I think one thing to sort of highlight is that you know, children's digital skills grow quite rapidly. So, you know, up until the age of around 12, this is research from 2016, uh, Bern et al. Um, they are sort of can be helped by their parents, but on average by age 12, they tend to sort of be at the same level as parents. And by 15, they tend to on average surpass their parents. Uh, this is just a function of sort of time spent with new devices, time spent experimenting, and of course, having access to peers and teachers who teach you different skills. Um, but this is just something we have to acknowledge, I think, that parents play a very formative role, particularly with younger children. But as the children age, there's really interesting, there's really interesting opportunities also for intergenerational co communication and for children and teenagers to help their parents. Um, and the biggest thing also with risk is to just establish the, the conversation, as Amina was saying, to be able to talk about these things, not just sort of what you're proud of and what you learn, but also what you don't know and what you'd like to learn more of. And I think that those kinds of boundaries and setting the stage for that conversation is really useful all the way through, all the way through lives and learning di digital skills, both for parents and for children in an ongoing way. Because as we know, technology is always changing. So even though we might feel like we've mastered it at one moment, two weeks later, we'll have something brand new to be challenged by. Thank you so much, uh, Tracy. Uh, thank you to all the speakers. Uh, we now finish here the interactive discussion on parenting in the digital age. And um, uh, I'm grateful for your participation and now turn back to Amanda. Thanks, Mrs. Kosmarska. We have reached the most awaited part of the event now. We will learn how an European region is establishing effective family policies. Also, how a new publication is meant to be the first practical guide to help young people in their online interactions. The first award will be presented by Mrs. Nora Uria, Vice President of IFFD. Nora, the floor is yours. Thank you. According to their coalition agreement for the government of the Austrian state of Corinthia, the goal is to make it the most child and friendly region in Europe. For that, they aim to keep a healthy, efficient healthcare system at the highest level, guaranteed by ensuring an extensive family doctor care, constructing health centers, accelerating ambulatory care, and safeguarding the location of, of Corinthian hospitals. Finally, they are committed to providing care that allows every human being to age in dignity and within a familiar environment. Over policy, other policies focus on education like elementary education and kindergarten, different kinds of secondary schools, tertiary education, cooperation with universities and counseling services for families in difficult life situations. Especially in these challenging times in relation to the coronavirus pandemic, which has been determining people's everyday life for months, it became more important to provide families with support and everyday advice. The psychological and financial burden that families in difficult life situations are already exposed to anyway has partly increased due to the massive restrictions in daily life. Also, the uncertain future prospects, often the loss of a family member's job, the lack of opportunities to adequately care for and educate children, represent an enormous challenge for the counseling institutions. Everyday life for families has changed massively. To support and accompany this as well as possible, but also to create new perspectives support services and funding opportunities will be the greatest challenge in the upcoming year, but especially also in the years to come. 
Therefore, the International Board of IFFD has decided to grant one of the 2021 IFFD awards to the government of the Austrian state of Carinthia for their commitment in making their region the most child and family friendly region in Europe through the follow up of the sustainable development goals and the Venice Declaration and the support and advice provided to families during these challenging times of the coronavirus pandemic. So congratulations. Congratulations to the region of Carinthia. And I now give the floor to His Excellency, Dr. Peter Kaiser, Governor of Carinthia, for the acceptance and words of appreciation. Doctor, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Excellences, dear representatives of the International Federation for Family Development, ladies and gentlemen, dear speakers and experts. The Carinthian government, represented by the Vice Governor Beate Bretner and the responsible person in our government for youth affairs, uh, Sarah Shah, we are very pleased to receive this award. It honors our efforts to make Carinthia the most child and family friendly region worldwide. Thank you very much also to all of you and thank you also to Ambassador Alexander Marschik, permanent representative of Austria to the United Nations for his inspiring statement. I send you the best greetings from the Milchstädter See, <laughs> connecting also the Wörter See. You know this region very well. Ladies and gentlemen, we are committed to implement the Sustainable Development Goals and the Venice Declaration because we want to support families and give all children the same opportunities. Let me briefly mention some of our measures and give you a short overview. To provide immediate support to families in difficult situations, this could be, for instance, financial problems or experience of violence and abuse, we offer free of charge counseling services also during the COVID-19 pandemic. For long-term improvement, we are convinced that education is key to encourage families. We strive to guarantee inclusive, equal and high quality education for all. We see education as a lifelong process of learning. Quality education needs the right infrastructure. We provide annual subsidies for the construction and renovation of school buildings. We also invest more in technical infrastructure to make our schools digitally fit, as it has been mentioned before. As you have discussed earlier, the global pandemic showed us the great value of new technologies. We should give all young people access to digital education under the same conditions. Besides being a learning space, schools should also be a space for personal development. Therefore, in our region, social workers in schools prevent and mediate potential conflicts. We, provi we provide equal access to education. Every child should have a place in childcare, regardless of the parent's income situation. With the child scholarship, we increasingly reduce parental contributions to childcare. We also financially support Slovenian German bilingual kindergartens. Carinthian Slovenes are an important minority group in our population. We want to promote multilingualism at an early, very early stage. Our education is inclusive. We teach and individually support children with special needs in small classes in regular schools. Also, a team of teachers and social pedagogues takes care of children with social behavior disorders in small groups. Besides education, housing is an important field where we consider the needs of families. We made clear in our building code that noise coming from children's playgrounds and schools is not a disturbance. This sends a clear signal for a child and family friendly Carinthia. To ensure that social housing remains affordable, this year we invest even more in housing subsidies. New guidelines also guarantee permanently low rents, 
combined with climate-friendly construction methods. These examples are only a very small part of our overall effort to support families and enable them to be agents of sustainable development. Receiving the award of IFFT encourages us to follow this path also in the future, and I hope with also continuing success. Let us be strong together. We need to join our forces at the international, at the European, at national, and last but not least, also at the regional level. Let us together take responsibility for a sustainable future for our children, grandchildren, and the following generations. Please congratulations to our second winner, Mr. Tom Harrison. I can say once more, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Dr. Kaiser. The second award will also be presented by Ms. Nora Ria, Vice President of IFFD. Nora, you may take the floor. Thank you. Dr. Harrison is a reader in character education pedagogy and practice and director of education at the Jubilee Center for Character and Virtues at the University of Birmingham. His interests are character education and virtue ethics, character, wisdom at the internet, youth social action and citizenship education. He was one of the invited speakers of the 20th World Congress of IFFD in October 2019 with more than a thousand delegates in attendance. During his presentation, he advanced some of the ideas in the book he was writing at the time. Now that book entitled Thrive, How to Cultivate Character So Your Children Can Flourish Online has been published. In it, he explains how parents and families can develop character and what he calls cyber wisdom in their children. He talks about his experience of bringing up his own children in the digital world of the United Kingdom. However, because the, the technologies and software are somewhat universal and global, many of the messages are applicable for parents around the world. The book is a source of advice and inspiration for any parent asking big questions. His core message is that we cannot wait for big tech or policymakers to get their acts together. Instead, we must seek to cultivate values qualities and skills in our children that make it more likely that they will do the right thing when interacting online. He also shows how you might do this through two models, react and thrive, which he first unveiled during his IFFD Congress presentation. Therefore, the International Board of IFFD has declared and decided to grant one of the 2021 IFFD awards to Dr. Tom Harrison for the publication of the Thrive Model, how to cultivate character so that children can flourish online as the first practical book of its kind to show parents and teachers how to develop character as the foundation for helping young people to thrive in their online interactions. So congratulations, Dr. Harrison. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Nora. And I'm truly humbled uh, to be receiving this uh, family award from the International uh, Federation for Family Development at this truly uh, auspicious event. Uh, and I want to thank UN DESA uh, and the Permanent Missions of Malaysia and the State of Qatar for the UN for hosting this event. Um, and for all the presentations so far, um, I really have learned a great deal for the team so far, and I've been scribbling down notes as uh, the presentation's gone on uh, for my next book. Um, in many ways, this book has been mentioned just now by, by Nora about parenting into digital aid, has been inspired by the work of the IFFD, and as, I, and as was mentioned, many of the ideas, I gave a first proper tryout, a first proper airing to that really large audience in London, and I got such nice feedback from that session uh, that the book has now um, uh, fully come to fruition and, and has been published recently, and I'm delighted to get this uh, award um, for it. Um, why spend so much time away from my family uh, writing a book? It's a question I've asked myself many times before. Uh, what really possessed me to do, uh, to, you know, to take on the task of writing a book, especially as writing a book about technology is, is so challenging as everything moves so fast. As has been mentioned by Tracy and others in the presentations earlier, the questions about, um, and, and Matt, the questions about the impact that technology is having on our children is, is, is in many ways or in many important 
question still unknown. Parents there told me that trying to parent in a digital age is sometimes like shooting in the dark while trying to hit a moving target. And that was one of the reasons I wanted to write Thrive was to help parents and families think about what it means to parent in the digital age. And also one thought really kept me going. And that was that technology may change, but what makes us essentially human tends to stay the same. Our ability to be kind, compassionate, caring, courageous, strive for justice, look for peace, be loving, and many other great qualities is ultimately really what matters. In short, our character. And character is ensured, endured as a central idea from the Greek uh, and Aristotelian times and being with us throughout history. Character is the backbone of the, my book Thrive, but it's also the backbone of uh, what I think many uh, families really need to survive and, uh, and successfully no negotiate the ups and downs of life. Uh, and I, in the book, I explain how our best endeavours to show how character uh, and be the best of ourselves, to be compassionate, honest and wise is really hard in the digital world. And that's why so many of our children's lives are negatively affected, sometimes seriously, by issues such as cyberbullying, misrepresentation, piracy and threats to their safety. But it's been said, and this is really stressed throughout my book, it's a positive book, I hope, that there are so many opportunities for our children in the internet. In many ways, the internet has been the hero of the pandemic. We've just been hearing about how home learning and other opportunities have been able to, to continue in, in many places, not, not everywhere, due to, um, due to the internet. How uh, uh, collaboration on vaccines and, and, uh, and responding to the pandemic has been supported by the internet. So we must be positive about it. And that's why I think focusing on the quality of cyber wisdom which is at the heart of the book the ability to make the right decision to do the right thing at the right time is really a focus of it because while rules are important so much of um, what's going to happen with technology in the future we cannot create rules for um, and I, I'm just reading through the, the report that Tracy posted online a minute ago the OECD report that talks about one of the most important parenting uh, approaches uh, is warm parenting and I think that really chimes with my message in the book that warm parenting is providing children with age appropriate autonomy and structure. So it's love and it's boundaries. It's actually ensuring that students are able to kind of start to develop character, to take on, on these decisions as they go forward. Um, so I, I don't want the book to be uh, letting off tech companies or policymakers. Of course, the big tech companies and the smaller ones and policymakers have a responsibility to help our children online. And we've heard really uh, great stories from Austria and elsewhere about how education is supporting in those sorts of areas. But, all, but right now, there's so many challenges about regulating tech companies that I think we need to look for help elsewhere. And I, hopefully in this book, I can show how that hope can come from our children. Because after all, it's our children who are going to be the designers and the makers of the technology in the future. And if we can help them understand how much values matter and how wisdom will shape um, you know, what they do, then hopefully values rather than just market value will be designed into the technologies of the future. Because after all, I think technologies only matter if they make us more human. So ultimately, I just want to say a big thank you again to uh, um, everyone at the IFFD uh, for um, uh, presenting me with this award. It's really uh, brought a huge smile to my face over the uh, last uh, few weeks. Um, and it's a real honour um, for, 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 for to, to, be, um, to be given this award. Uh, so thank you so much indeed. We thank you, Dr. Harrison. Now, it's my privilege to introduce Ambassador Sayed from the Permanent Mission of Malaysia to the United Nations for the closing remarks. Please keep in mind that afterwards, we will feature our Young People's Initiative with a very short production. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, I would like to congratulate and thank the International Federation for Family Development, the permanent mission of the State of Qatar and UN DESA Division for Inclusive Social Development for co-organizing this event. I would also like to congratulate the winners of this year's IFFT's Family Awards. I believe it is fair to say that we have had a very enriching and constructive discussion today. Indeed, the COVID-19 pandemic has greatly impacted families. As a parent myself, I believe that uh, I share the excitement and anxiety of many other parents in dealing 
and adapting to this new norm of parenting in the digital age. The panelists today have shared and focused on the challenges that we face, the leaps and strides that need to be taken as we move forward in the new norm. I thank the panelists for their insights and their presentations. From the discussions, there's no denying that the pandemic and the digital world has both positive and negative impacts on our daily lives. In adapting to this, a holistic and continuous approach is necessary to ensure that the family's well-being remain intact. In the Malaysian context, we are cognizant that digital technology now, more than ever, plays an important role in the society today. Malaysia has reached 98.7% smartphone, smartphone penetration rate and 47% of our children are digi digitally connected. But as mentioned by many, more needs to be done to address the digital gap, particularly in the age of the pandemic. Addressing the gap will contribute to effective parenting and wholesome child development we have a view to build back better in achieving the 2030 Agenda and implementation of the SDGs. To meet this, the Malaysian government has introduced stimulus packages for the second movement control order, which among others uh, includes telecommunication incentives, such as free mobile phone with 120 gigabyte internet data, specifically for the bottom 40 lower income group, 100 Malaysian ringgit e-wallet money for university students, as well as one of cash aid. Currently, during the pandemic, methods in disseminating educational material have also been diversified through technology platforms such as e-learning applications, as well as through social media. Given the rise of domestic violence, technology platforms are also used to share information on parenting to promote family values as well as offer consultation services with certified family counselors. Training of trainers programs for NGOs and parenting programs for communities are also being conducted via digital technology and using handheld devices. Malaysia is also partnering with UNICEF to enhance, to enhance the current positive parenting programs. Lastly, steps are being taken to ensure that policy makers, industry players, and global media partners in Malaysia continue to support parents in developing a better digital environment for children, families, and communities. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we have heard a wide range of perspectives from participants of different situations, different approaches, and different ways of parenting in the digital age. These are lessons that we can draw and a lot of food for thought as takeaways from these discussions. I hope all of us will go back eager, armed with new ideas, broader perspectives, and greater confidence to help further strengthen and enhance the foundations of our countries, families, and the key to our futures, our children. Lastly, let us come together and work hand in hand to ensure the safety and well-being of our children, as well as facilitate and equip parents with better coping skills to overcome challenges in the digital era. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. And now, please listen for a couple of minutes to what our youngest members are doing worldwide. Friendship. Comunicación. Memory. Crescita personale. Apasionante. Fondo. Condivision. Verbundenheit. Oh. 
popularity. Thinking deeply. Attention. Inspiration. Relation. Relate. Reflexion. In a hekemisha. In the sound. Premiana Messi. Ata cruz atos. Crecimiento. Alegría. Pananao. Guardiasa. Amistad. Oh my god. One word. Two curves. Mundo. Yes. Libertad. With this, we have reached the end of the our event. Thank you very much for your presence here today. Stay safe, and I hope to see you all next year in New York. Goodbye for now. <laughs>